opportunity to visit about my research and this is, um, this is an attempt to present and to reflect upon some of the research I'm currently doing with a group of animal scientists working uh, in France and researching animal emotion. Animal emotion in farm animals, which is quite an innovative type of research because animal emotions has been uh, traditionally studied in more charismatic Theories of method 
is reminiscent of Paracelsian Dynamis, emphasizing the mutual relativeness of all things. Leibniz viewed the world as an organic whole in which all parts were interconnected and interrelated. Matter was alive and contained a force or a principle of change within it. As Leibniz put it, there is a world of creatures, living beings, animals, and ladies, souls, in the smallest particle of matter. Each part of the matter can be thought of as a garden full of plants or as a pond full of fish. But each branch of the plant, each member of the animal, each drop of its humors is also such a garden, such a pond. <coughs> With the arrival of the Enlightenment, Paracelsus' work lost authority, and the idea that the resemblance, resemblance between a sign on a plant to an organ of a human body could be the basis for medical treatment was disregarded. And the concept of signature disappear from Western science. What are animals then if we abandon the theory of signature? What Timingo has argued that we cannot really claim to be close to a final answer to such a question, because the question is not one of the kind that admits such an answer. But the purpose of asking is that it forces us to be more explicit about the assumption that we carry into the search for answers to other more limited questions, of a kind more amenable to empirical investigation. So in the following, inspired by Ingold and Arroway, I will argue that there is no way to define animals. They feel us, they nature, or they virtue is given. Because they are always a fact. They don't pre-exist the network that bring them into being. Or to put it differently and borrow it from Latour, an animal is what is made to act by many others. Is not the source of an action, but the moving target of a vast array of entities is warming towards it. This implies, as Coyle has argued, <coughs> that no animals have meaning without the reference to the other forces, intensities, affects, and direction to which it is conjoined, and within which it's always in the process of becoming something other, something new. In this perspective, the signatorial method with signatorial strategies, as Agamben put it, rather than a theory of signature, might be more fruitful to address the search for answers to what in has called the more limited questions, those of a kind more amenable to empirical investigation. Therefore, the question I will address are what are farm animals' emotions? How are they in research in practice? What do they tell us about the life of farm animals? In animal welfare science, a line of research on farm animals' emotion has been recently developed and has been inspired by the work of Ian Duncan, David Fraser, Mark Beckhoff, and many other pathologists. There are different approaches to the studies of animals' emotion. Isabel Biesse and other colleagues at the Indra Laboratories in France have used the following definition of emotion for informing their research, borrowing it from ancient decree and other uh, sign and other um, philosophers. The word emotion comes from a Latin emovere, to remove or share, and mover, to move. An emotion can be roughly defined as something that moves one's body and mind. Emotion are more often defined by their component, the internal psychological component, the neurophysiological uh, component, how the body responds, for example, by stress responses, and the behavioral component, what one shows to others, for example, the facial expression and movement. Emotions different from sensation, which are only physical consequences, for example, heat, and from feelings, which designate only internal states with no reference to external reactions. So these authors have proposed to use a kind of behavioral approach based on cognitive psychology. Emotion can be then investigated in farm animals in terms of the individual appraisal of the situation. And this evaluative process depends on the intrinsic characteristic of the eliciting event, the sadness, the novelty, the pleasantness, the degree of conflict of that event with the individual needs or expectation, and the individual coping capacities offered by the environment. The result of such evaluation is actually affecting the negative versus positive emotion. 
and building on results of several experiments which have been carried on since 2009. This group of scientists, Yesse, Bossi and others, argue that the present theory, theories provide a useful framework for the study of the nature of subjective experiences in animals, which could, be, could help to understand you know, what are the welfare, their welfare requirements. However, this is a very contested line of research, and there are disputes over whether farm animals are actually able to feel emotion, rather than simply react to them. The contested issue is whether farm animals are similar enough to human beings to experience all three components of emotions as described in humans. It is generally agreed that animals have emotional responses, such as increased heart rate or changes in variability reflecting the balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic branches of the autonomic uh, nervous system, or okay, they can release uh, corticosteroid in blood. But the issue of whether animals feel emotions, so the psychological component, remain controversial. And this debate is taking place in academic journal and academic uh, conferences. Notwithstanding this debate that I don't want to contribute to, in animal welfare science, the emotion approach. Uh oh, this is. <laughs> Fear, 
and what is bringing about the positive emotions such as happiness and how to measure the level of negative and positive emotions ex experienced by sheep. So, recently I spent six weeks in Clermont-Ferrand in, the, in their research center where there are more than 700 animal scientists, some 300 cows and about 200 sheep into experimental farms. I joined the animal behavior team, just less than 20 scientists and PhD students who are doing, as I said, research on animal selection. And I participated for six weeks in the training of one day experiment on stress and fear on sheep. So the animals are hosted in a farm. The specific problem that they wanted to address was whether, whether the repeated experience of negative emotions, such as fear, would lead to negative bias, pessimistic perception of the environment, and vice versa, whether positive emotion would lead to an optimistic perception of the environment. They investigated the role of interaction between emotion and judgment to better assess the affective state of the animals. And they used a drug, diazepam, as a way of pharmacologically manipulating the affective state of the sheep that they were using in an experiment on cognitive bias. So this drug is generally used to reduce negative affective states, mainly by reducing fearfulness. Here, they investigated whether the reduction of fearfulness through a pharmacological approach could reduce sort of pessimistic-like judgment in labs. They tested the effect of this drug, known for its anxiolytic properties in many species, including humans, in this Romain um, breed. Um, they used a five-month-old female labs. So these are these are labs. Now, in order to organize the experiment, they um, selected a flock of a herd of 48, 48 sheep. For the training, before I actually um, carried out the experiment, these sheep were trained for several weeks to identify and remember the location of fear illicit events and the location of a positive emotion event. These sheep have been selected for high productivity, as you've seen before, they produced many, many lambs. But they are very, very fearful, and they would be unsuitable to live outdoors, because a simple noise or an expected event would scare them, and they would abandon their lambs. And if they don't find the lambs within an hour from the time it is abandoned, they will forget that, and they will not look. So for the training of the sheep, um, that they were hosted in these little pens, the sheep were invited to go in the theater in pair. At the beginning, they were wearing, um, as I show you here, they were wearing a heart belt, and then some of their physiological measures were taken. The technician would take blood samples and saliva samples to check the level of cortisol. After the initial phase of observation and sample taking, the scientists were able to link the level of stress, as indicated by the level of cortisol in the blood and the saliva, as well as the speed of the heartbeat, to the facial expression of the sheep, more precisely to the posture of the ears. Once they accomplished this, they didn't need to record all the physiological measures anymore, but they were able to judge the level of fear or stress just by looking at the ear posture. The training is repeated every day. It takes about three hours for the entire 48 sheep, and it goes on for two or three months before the actual experiment can be carried out. Before the experiment started, there were several discussion and decision. Well, the team needed to agree upon a research protocol, the format of the training, the actual design of the experiment, and the design of the experimental theater. The experiment design entailed that two sheep would carry out the test each time. This procedure was adopted to reduce the stress experienced by the sheep while carrying out the experiment. <coughs> Um, herd animals, they don't like to be separated from their companions. 
working in ca capillaries less stressful. And moreover, it is allowed to test whether the presence of a dominant companion would reduce or enhance the feeling of fear. The fear-inducing event were designed to reproduce common events or condition on farms, a sudden noise produced by a car or low-flying plane, a wet bedding, a delay on distribution of food, or herding with a dog or sheep. And the choice of this event was an open criticism towards more invasive type of experiment, for example, those in model experiment carried out on mice and using electroshocks by the invasive technique to induce fear, which would be unnecessarily disturbing for the sheep. The training, which is the most time consuming activity of the sheep, involved a PhD student organizing the daily preparatory work for the experiment, an animal carer working with the PhD student in handling the sheep, and then a technician in the phys physiology lab processing the blood sample and calculating the level of cortisol for each pair of sheep in each event, and the technician in the multimedia lab looking at the facial expression and the ear posture of the sheep and using the software, a specific software, for analyzing the behavior of the sheep. And finally, the chief scientist <coughs> um, in another building receiving and putting together all this data in making a correlation between a certain level of cortisol in blood and saliva and a certain facial expression and other elements of the sheep behavior. The experimental theater is adjacent to the barn where the larger flock of sheep was actually housed. Here there were only four small groups of 12 sheep each and within these groups there were the dominant and the subordinate sheep. The experimental theater was equipped with technologies and devices including video recording cameras, animal feed, colorful flag instrument for producing a loud noise, a bucket for the wheat, a food reward, TV monitor, barriers and pens to keep apart the groups of sheep. And finally, there were documents, legal forms, animal consent, protocol checklist, and labels for blood and samples, labels for video tapes, valuation documents, and not food. The work Start in the morning at around 9 a.m. The PhD student and myself is there, joined the animal carrier in the barn where, the, where there is the experimental theater. The PhD student introduced me to the sheep and shows me the procedures for the training. The animal carrier checks the necks of the sheep. In the previous week, there has been an infection and they want to make sure that they are okay. The first 12 sheep are moved to a pen next to the experimental theater and separated from the others by a door. The experimental theater needs to be prepared, and so both the PhD students and the carer attend to various tasks. The bucket with wheat is located on one corner of the room, and the window closed with a sliding door, where at, large, at the later stage, a bright red flag will appear. The video cameras need to be switched on, the tapes need to be checked, as well as the sliding door that give access to the sheep in the actual experimental site. And the list of pairs of sheep needs to be prepared with various combinations of dominant and subordinate form. The first pair of sheep is chosen by the PhD student. And now uh, let's hope the things work. <coughs> and I'll give you a sample. Okay. Oh, what's happening? chosen by the PhD student and the carer, it separates them from the others and brings them outside the pen. The sheep, they try to resist it. Then the carer opens the door and leads to the experimental theater and shows the way to the sheep. They've done it, this task several times in the earlier week, and they quickly go where they are supposed to be. The PhD student standing outside the theater watches carefully the first pair of sheep approaching and she says, oh, slowly, slowly, to remind them that they need to be calm if they don't want to fall. The sheep approach the bucket, you see, um, and this is clearly dominant sheep. And when the wheat is finished, you know, the carer opens the sliding door and leads the pair of sheep back in the pen. 
and the PhD students refilled the book in with a bit of wheat, just a handful, otherwise they spent too much time in the pen, and they repeat the experiment with another, with another couple. The coordination of all these heterogeneous materials and the synchronization of all the phases is important for the success of the experiment. So for instance, the carer needed to separate and hold a couple of sheep that each time were called by the PhD students to perform the trial experiment. She had to acquire an intimate knowledge of all 48 sheep in order to remember the dominant one and the subordinate ones. Then she also needed to record the data and to refill the bucket with some wheat for the following cup. And the coordination of devices is important too. For instance, the behavior of the sheep is recorded by a fixed camera with a wide angle lens to capture the whole theater. And a reliable film of the behavior of the sheep can be obtained only if the choreography of all those relations worked. The day of training ends at about 12 p.m. After all the relevant combination, pairs of sheep have carried out the trial experiment. Then the carer leads the sheep back in the barn and starts cleaning the pen. <coughs> and the experimental theater with the PhD students, who also collects the videotapes, her notes, and make arrangements for the following day. Then the PhD student goes back in the barn with the sheep and makes sure that they are okay. And the sheep greet her and get closer, and she strokes them. They're also curious about me. I'm an intruder, but they're not worried. Alexander showed me how they changed the ear posture when I joined the, team, the pen. And the ear posture indicates that the sheep are attentive, curious, but not feeling fear. So the PhD students point to number 17, the braver and her favorite, the one who's always leading the group and keen in doing the experiment. Now, this is a set of events and the sequence of scientific practices that offer insights of what the search for animals' emotion might entail in practice. This is the more modest and more limited question that I want to address. And this story suggests that animals' emotion, either fear or bravery, a precarious accomplishment rather than matter of fact, and indeed a very much matter of care in the conduct of the, of the research. They are best characterized by emphasizing the arrangement of ordinary materials and by looking at the role of the <coughs> in action, such as the pens and red, red flaps, the TV monitors, or the buckets, as they can play a central role in the configuration of human activity. To emphasize the arrangement of ordinary material and the choreography of this experiment shed lights on the need for the coordination of the sets of heterogeneous relations the work of the animal carrier, the PhD students, as well as the sheep, the sheep in the experimental theater, and the coordination of different tasks in disparate sites, the barns, the physiology lab, the multimedia lab, and the scientist office. In tracing the association forged between the carer, the sheep, the student, the equipment, the barns, the cameras, the laboratory technician, or cat, the other lambs, the farms, the farm worker, the work the other side, between the humans and non-human participants in this experiment, I've chosen to look at the scientific practice without scientists narrating the steps that led to their achievement. Instead, I focus my attention on what the PhD student, the sheep, the animal carrier, the laboratory technician, the heartbeat bell, the blood sample, the video recording cameras, and the many other devices involved do while taking part in the experiment. Here, I borrow insight from many um, ANT practitioners who, by looking at the range of different practices, from shopping, like Kushua, or scallop farming, Michel Calum, or salmon farming, John Doe, and Marianne Lien, the multi multidisciplinary study of the Amazon forest, Natura, etc., have drawn attention on the performativity of all the non human participants in these practices. And this is what I propose it might be called, with a gamble, a signatoria strategy. No.
The experimental theatre in this story is equipping the ship with a number of devices that swarm towards them and arm them with the ability to feel emotion. The bucket with wit eliciting positive emotion, the scary event from the sliding door to elicit negative emotion, the heartbeat belt recording the beat of the heart, the blood samples recording the level of cortisol, the video camera recording the movement of the ears and facial expression, <coughs> the gentle handling by the carer and the PhD student facilitating the smooth progress of the training and the bond to work together, the fearfulness reducing drug able to make it a braver shape, all contribute to the success of the experiment and the production of another scientific paper that in this case, for example, will help to make a case for addressing animal fearfulness in animal breeding and in animal handling for improving animal welfare. All this suggests that the search for holistic view of animals might be misleading. As Law um, and others have argued, in a performative world, the idea that practices might melt together for, within, or around the animal to generate the creature as a seamless form makes little sense. We need instead to imagine that animals, indeed, like people, are more or less the century, that they are contingent patchwork as subjects, as bodies and as elements in collectivity. For a performative theory of the animal, tell us that any attachment to standard organic metaphors is likely to be deceptive. To understand animals in their complexity, we will need to look beyond bodies. And looking beyond bodies with a signatorial method, as suggested by Agamemnon, a method that abandons the hope to find the theos, the very nature of animals, might produce new um, modestly promising enactments on non-human animals, the happy chicken that I study, or the fearful and the brave sheep, a sheep equipped with emotion that asks for more demanding relations to her cares than the sheep as a body that just produces lambs. These new figures might resemble what Donna Haraway has called the string figures. String figures are like stories. They propose and enact patterns for participants to inhabit somehow a vulnerable and wounded earth. My multi-species stories telling is about recuperation and complex histories that are as full of dying as living, as full of endings, even genocide, the killing of kind as beginning. In the face of unrelenting historically specific circles suffering in companion species, I'm not interested, nor do I believe it possible, to have a reconciliation or restoration but I'm deeply committed to the more modest possibility of partial recuperation and getting on together. So I look for real stories of science and art. These stories in which multi-species players were enmeshed in partial flow translation of difference we do ways of living and dying to the still possible final flourishing or maybe recuperation. And I hope that my story is one of those. Thank you, very, very interesting intervention. And I have a question and an observation about this. Um, you describe as a scientific experiment. So uh, the attempt to um, understanding and, and categorizing human and uh, animal, animal feelings with uh, rational and, and experimental <coughs> inputs. But my, my the question is, wouldn't you agree that in less scientific and more pragmatic contexts such as uh, farms and, and <coughs> uh, grazing pastures and the like, there are in fact um, pragmatic, um, pragmatic methods of, uh, of, of mutual, mutual understanding between animals and humans, and if yes, how these methods could be analyzed and integrated in the scientific analysis of, of animal and animal feelings? Uh, I think is, there is lots of you know, evidence, 
kind of evidence that farmers, who, whoever lives with animals, has a kind of a understanding of the ways of communicating with the animals and understandings of the state, emotional states of animals. But if you move in the domain of science, when you discover that animals' emotion is the most contested issue, the now science is on. And the very idea is that you can study emotions in animals by using cognitive psychology concept, so borrowing from human studies and applying them to animals, is being considered like outrageous. And it's been really a kind of war in animal science because nobody's denied that animals react, that animals actually are able to react to stimuli that they, you know, they can feel fear, is when you try to link the reaction to the cognitive understanding of it. So when you move from the reaction to the actual emotion, that's where the contestation is happening. And nobody, and it's still very difficult to, you know, to find that this kind of, a, it's still very difficult to argue for that. And it's really strong anthropomorphic kind of understanding of emotion that wants to set aside you know, what is possible in non-human animals and what is possible in animals. So you said that there is an ideological resistance. Not a, yeah, well, I think it's an, an assumption. As I said, what are the assumptions that we bring into the science that we do? The assumption is that humans are different in kind from other animals, not and this is the assumption that has informed all this line of research and the sound. I, I guess my point that might help would be two, twofold. The first is, has that been improved in humans between emotion, between response and emotion? That we're expecting animals to go through experiments that we don't go through to prove our own emotionality. That would be my first question. Um, but also, if this is a specific property that has emerged within humanity, at what point within human evolution did it emerge? Oh, that's a year. Because where was the magic moment at which instinct became cognition? And I've never found <coughs> a sensible answer. I mean, if you, look, if you look at the studies of emotion in philosophy of science, for example, the very concept of emotion as universal in humans is very contested. Uh, emotion is very much linked to language. And so, Lynch and Depre, for example, has very, very eloquently explained how there is a universal language of emotion. And then, in many cultures, you know, the concept of fear, as we know it in Western culture, doesn't exist. And there isn't a language to describe it. Now, I, I don't, you know, I, I'm not equipped to, to, <laughs> to tell you when these. these distinction between what we call instinct and, and what is emotion has happened um, in, it's outside my, my field of research, but I know that um, talking about emotion for non-human animals is a very, very recent, very, very recent question. Um, while there has been in, in literature, there has been looking in antiquity as well, there has always been an understanding of animals um, as very complex beings, as, as, um, you know, as beings that they can act in the world and they have a, a sense of where they are and how they relate to others. The language of emotion and the investigations about emotion is less than 20 years old. The investigation of emotions in non-human animals is less than 20 years old. And so it's very, very new and very contested and it's a great fun to look at. Some of those model psychosis theories led 
for it. And he's preferred. You know, it's, it's very, it's one of the easy way of you know, using the drugs. You can divide, you know, as they did it in this experiment, you can divide the sheep, the one that's been treated with the drug, and so they will be greater with a control group, and they know exactly how much drug they use, and they can keep on You can use alternative methods because they know that, you know, you can, if you train, like these are long-term experiments. So if you conduct, for example, if you, if you rear animals in a very nurturing environment where there is no competition for food, for example, they receive a positive re reinforcement all the time, they have a positive attitude to life. So they're more, you know, prone to explore, they're braver, and if you, if you breed animals, if you keep them in restrictive food access, a fearful environment, no social contact, they're very fearful. They are very fearful. But this is a long term, it's a long term experiment. It takes one or two generations of animals, is, and is, they are more viable to keep on consideration. But they are equally done. They, they are, they, currently, they are equally done. Nice one, as they say. <laughs> um, I've, I've got a string, I'm going to do a string, okay? Not a string figure, but a string of thought. Um, can I take a few moves? Yes, please Before do. I get to the question. Um, I thought what was interesting is that the, the experiment that you described is to do with making babies, where yeah. animals are not being made killable. Quoting Harold again, the idea of making killable. So, what's interesting here for me is that if you take the, 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 the distinction between the human and the animal, which is that we have sub, we're subjects and we have subjectivity, and animals don't. Yeah, that's the that's the key to the idea of emotion. That they're not subjects. So, this is the moment in which science does this fantastic acrobatic trick. Yeah. that actually suddenly it's all about the subject, not the object. Yeah. So that the, 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 the sheep is now, is it a subject or is it not a subject? But what's interesting about your particular experiment is that the, 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 the bringing into being of the sheep subject, the brave sheep or whatever, is in the context of sheep mothers looking after their babies. It's not in the context of those sheep that are being raised to be killed. Yeah. I suppose the lambs probably maybe are going to be killed. But you see, so there's something really interesting here. You know, why this moment, okay, in science uh, do animals suddenly be given subjectivity? What, what's going on here? And it's something to do with killability. I mean, I'm sure that's, yeah. But isn't it interesting that these are these sheep mothers? So I wondered if you if you had thought about that in the paper or, or opened that up at all. Yeah, I think if, you know, if I think about my conversation, you know, with with the with, with all of them, the mothers are more interesting than the lambs because they live longer, because they stay in the farm, because they and they have to look after the babies. So, is in the context, is, you know, research never takes place in a vacuum. It's always about, you know, it's always doing something, and he's always doing something somewhere. So, these ideas that these very productive sheep, actually, these are the, the one, this is Clermont Ferrand in November, the experiment was in, in the summer, and this is in November. You know, now, now they started to put them outdoors. Well, for years and years, they were only kept indoors because they had many lambs and they, they, they were not, you know, they couldn't trust the sheep to look after the babies. Um, and so, you know, keeping them differently, you know, changing the, the farming practices led them to actually change and experiment on, you know, what is like living outdoors, whether they actually can live outdoors and be good mothers, you know, as they, they hope they will be. So in, I think for the animal scientists, it's very interesting, these ideas that these are animals, that they, they relate to them in a, in a, for a longer period of time. These are animals that they can actually, you know, they can actually intervene. But this is, you know, the, the interesting part is that the, the theater, the laboratory and the theater is next door to the, to the farm. 
And so the lambs actually, they get the source. Mm. This, the killability is not, is not removed no. from a type of more, you know, from a type of more careful or affected kind of sounds, um, which is in engaging with animals. What I argue is that actually is producing an animal which is more complex, which is asking more demanding questions, which is posing new questions. But the killability is not part of it. Thanks so much, Steve, for our friend's invitation. 